Welcome to Science in Your Shopping Cart, a new series that shows how science touches many of the products you buy at the grocery store, from new varieties of fruits and vegetables to technological advances that make your food safer, cheaper, and tastier. I'm Todd Silver. Apples. They're as American as, well, apple pie. Americans love their apples, from Gala to Granny Smith to Honeycrisp, and the tons of delicious products that apples go into. Apples are a very sustainable and plentiful fruit. More than 7,500 farmers manage over 300,000 acres of apple orchards, producing over 30 billion apples every year. Apples may be versatile, as they can be grown in a multitude of climates and conditions, but they are also vulnerable to pests, diseases, severe weather, and other natural enemies. In addition, apple picking and selection can be labor-intensive, driving up costs for farmers from New York to Washington. These factors can have a significant impact on the quality of apples in your market. Think the look, the crunch, the sweetness, and how much you pay for them. Today, we're going to look at some pretty cool innovations and research that ARS scientists are conducting to ensure those apples in your shopping cart are fresh, tasty, cost-friendly, and high quality. And we're going to do a lot of this virtual, so pack a light lunch and join me on our apple picking tour with a first stop in Geneva. We start our apple picking tour in Geneva. No, 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 not that Geneva. Geneva, New York. It's located in the Finger Lakes region. Here, researchers are breeding apple rootstocks that are more resistant to pests and disease, that bear more delicious fruit, and are more ideal for apple growers to pick and prune. I took a virtual walk with Dr. Gennaro Fazio, research geneticist at ARS's Plant Genetic Resources Unit here in Geneva. The rootstock is responsible for modulating the way the, uh, the grafted apple produces, and it can also influence the way it tastes. <clears throat> See this part right here that has all the crinkly bark. This is the rootstock, all right? And attached to it is the scion. This was grafted uh, maybe eight or nine years ago, and uh, it grew into a, you know, small nursery tree and then planted it in this, in this field. Most of these trees on this row are, are Fuji trees. You can see right here, some of these apples are beginning to turn color. The rootstock of an apple tree is key because it forms the roots and lower trunk of the tree. The rootstock determines the tree's size, when it will bear fruit, and how well it resists diseases. It's here in this testing field that researchers plant the rootstocks, then they allow them to grow and determine their best traits along with any limitations. ARS has testing fields all over the country, enabling researchers to grow and evaluate new rootstocks in a variety of climates, conditions, and soils. Stocks where it used to be there, and uh, here's a nice one. One thing I noticed on our walk was that two of the same types of trees standing right next to each other, they look much different. It's interesting that uh, you've noticed that the trees look different. These trees were grafted and planted at the same time. This one right here would be a contender in, in, uh, in a green program. This one is on its way out. It's dying. And the reason these have died is that this area was underwater for like close to six months. And roots don't like to be underwater. But somehow, trees next to it survived. And that's due to the genetics of the rootstock. You may not know it, but the apple you're eating today probably came from a rootstock developed by ARS. That's because Dr. Fazio and his colleagues have successfully bred rootstocks that have great appeal to apple growers, including resistance to fire blight, replant disease, and other diseases that can destroy hundreds of acres of apple trees. I've seen tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of trees affected by fire blight and dying like that. This basically is on its way out. Next year, we'll probably have to cut it down. But then this is the benefit of having a fire blight resistant rootstock is that even though you have fire blight in the top part that is affecting it, the tree still survives and is still able to produce. Fire blight is a deadly bacterial disease that causes blockages in a tree's vascular system. It's like a human having a clogged artery. 
Replant disease is a soil-borne disease that results in reduced productivity in fields repeatedly planted to the same or closely related trees. What used to happen is, for example, if, if we pull these trees out, the, they're of a particular rootstock that promotes these negative fungi and bacteria and to grow. What happens is that they're left over in the soil, and when you go plant a new new, very young tree with a sensitive root system, the tree just sits there. It's, it's, it gets stunted. Some growers needed to fumigate the whole field and hope that the disease or diseases would go away. And so you begin to see the influence that the rootstock has overall in, in the whole industry. Having rootstocks that are tolerant to those replant situations where you could plant these rootstocks, not fumigate, and still have profitable production in, in, your, in your field. In addition to breeding disease-resistant rootstocks, ARS researchers are designing rootstocks that consistently yield more apples that are ripe for the picking. If you can imagine a rootstock that can produce 10 more apples per tree per year, a rootstock can really make a huge difference in the bottom line of an apple grower. Okay, let's do some math. If you're a grower and you can produce just 10 more apples per tree and you have 1,200 trees per acre and 50 acres, that's a bounty of 600,000 more apples. And on top of producing all those apples, your apple trees are more resistant to some of the most common diseases. It's a big win for both producers and apple lovers. In the future, Dr. Fazio sees his lab as more of a design center for apple growers. He noted that just 10 years ago, around 90% of the apples grown in this country were represented by just two rootstocks. That number has since tripled, and the diversity of rootstocks continues to grow. Our strength is, I think, in diversity and providing a more customized option to apple growers than, than we used to have. The rootstock designed for a specific situation, and that's a good thing for the industry. Out in the orchards, harvesting and sorting apples can be labor-intensive. Harvesting accounts for around 15% of total production costs, and that number jumps to over a third when you add post-harvest storage and packing. ARS researcher Dr. Renfu Liu heard the calls from growers to build a machine that would save on these costs and become more efficient with harvesting. Dr. Liu works at the Sugar Beet and Bean Research Lab in East Lansing, Michigan. There, he teamed up with industry partners to develop a self-propelled apple harvest and infield sorting machine. The inspiration came from my interaction with growers the, about 10 years ago, and uh, quite a few growers expressed their desire to have uh, the technology which will allow them to uh, sort out those low quality or defect fruit in the orchard. They said, well, that will really save them a lot in post-harvest handling. Hard to believe that with all the technology we have today, apple picking and selection in many orchards is still a manual and costly process. Apples are typically picked and then sent to warehouses in large bins, with some of these bins weighing over a thousand pounds. There, the growers pay to have the apples evaluated and graded. Highly graded apples are selected for fresh produce, while mid-graded are often used for processing. Think like applesauce. Low-graded are set for making juice or culling. These low-graded apples can be costly in two ways. First, they take up warehouse space, which means they're incurring the same packing costs as highly graded apples. Second, low-graded apples can damage other apples in the bins. You know the saying, one bad apple can spoil the entire bunch. If you can do the inferior sorting, technology will enable you to know the quality grade of individual fruit. Okay, let's break down this machine. It's about six feet wide, 20 feet long, and 10 feet tall. Large metal rods hold the different machine parts in place. It has adjustable platforms that enable pickers to either stand on the ground or atop the machine, and then reach out and grab the fruit and then place it on these conveyors. Now there are conveyor belts everywhere. 
Some spin gently to roll the apples, and some have these large pins that secure the apples in place. The conveyors meet in the middle, where a computer vision system sorts and grades the apples, up to 12 per second. The apples are then dropped into different bins based on their grade. Well, I shouldn't say dropped, because that's another big issue that Dr. Liu addressed with his machine. The bean feeder actually is a very critical component for any harvest, uh, automated harvest system. Now you need to put the apples into the bean without bruising them. That's the biggest challenge. Right now, uh, apple harvest has still is not fully mechanized or automated because no mechanical harvester is able to prevent bruising during harvest. If you watch the video, we use some foam roller which allow us to drop apple from as high as five feet distance down into the bean filler because we use another pair of foam roller to receive it without damaging. The machine itself has a rather simple design, albeit with a number of smart, innovative technologies. But most important, the machine is built compact, so it can easily move through densely populated apple trees. Like Dr. Liu said, you really need to check out the video to see this thing in action. The machine has drawn interest from manufacturers looking to build it on a commercial scale. That's good news for growers who are interested in saving time and money on harvesting, grading, and storing apples. We got a quite a, a lot of positive uh, feedback from growers. Yeah, they, they like our sorting system and also the fruit, uh, the, the bean filler design, and uh, which kind of unique and very innovative and effective. I already got a, a quite a few inquiries. A couple of days ago, I got an inquiry from uh, South Africa. So why, uh, where can I purchase the machine? <laughs> These days, growers are more conscious of pesticide spraying, especially when it comes to overspraying their crops. ARS researchers and their partners have developed and tested an innovative laser-guided sprayer to help growers apply precise amounts of pesticide. Dr. Heepin Zhu is an ARS agricultural engineer who led the development of the precision spray technology. He works at ARS's Application Technology Research Unit in Worcester, Ohio. There are so many benefits with this new technology. It significantly reduces pesticide use and waste with the retrofit kit growers themselves can upgrade their own sprayers to precision sprayers rather than buying new sprayers and spray manufacturers do not need to change their spray designs either the precision sprayer uses high-speed laser scanning technology to image tree structures and then controls the spray outputs of an air-assisted variable rate spraying system to match targeted tree structures. So basically, it scans the individual trees and then tells the sprayers where and how much to spray. ARS technician Adam Clark gave me a tour of the sprayer. The LiDAR sensor, which is here, and what this is is, is the eye of the sprayer. So this, this LiDAR sensor lets the sprayer see the targets and will spray not only according to whether or not it sees a tree, but also can change the rate based on the density of the tree or the density of the leaves. Speed sensor right here keeps track of the speed of the sprayer. The faster you go, the more liquid you need to put out. In the tractor, we've mounted a touchscreen computer and a switch box for the operator to have easy control over the power of the system and also be able to select each side of the sprayer. I watched the precision sprayer in action at Ballman Orchards in Rittman, Ohio, not too far from Akron. Speaking of Akron, this machine has LeBron James potential for sure. The sprayer can treat one to six rows of trees at a time. Conventional spray application technology requires excessive amounts of pesticide for effective control. But the precision sprayer characterizes the presence, size, shape, and foliage density of target trees and applies just the right amount of pesticide in real time. 
I spoke with Bill Bauman, owner of Bauman Orchards in Ohio. He said this intelligence sprayer is a game changer for his business. We farm close to 260 acres, mostly apples and peaches. And for the last 35 years, we've used the conventional sprayer. We started using the intelligence sprayer that was retrofitted on my sprayer. I feel that I'm saving 50% of my chemical spray or chemical cost. We have not had any difference in pest control. I really like it on the peaches because the first few years, you know, you might have eight, 10 feet in between your trees and you can't shut your conventional sprayer off between each tree. You know, it automatically shuts off where there's no tree or in a block where you might have trees that are different sizes or maybe missing a tree. It will shut off there so you're not spraying where there's not a tree. Okay, let's talk numbers. In field tests across the country on a variety of crops, the precision sprayer reduced pesticide use between 30 and 85%, reduced ground loss by 90%, and reduced spray drift up to 87%. That's the amount of chemicals lost in the air. Growers can save between $50 and $800 per acre, depending on the crop types. Savings aside, tests show the precision sprayer was just as effective at pest control than traditional sprayers, and less spray means fewer chemicals sprayed on our delicious apples. It also protects our critical pollinators that help these orchards thrive. Think bees, butterflies, and other beneficial insects. This new system is the product of a decade's worth of research and development in collaborations with many research and extension educators. The intelligence spray system was commercialized by Smart Guided Systems in 2019 under the name Smart Apply. Growers across the United States and in other countries have upgraded their sprayers with Smart Apply, and they're already reaping the benefits. It saves growers money. It is good for our ecosystem, and it offers a sustainable and environmentally responsible approach to protecting crops. Okay, time for a snack break. How about we sink our teeth into some apple trivia, courtesy of the University of Illinois Extension. Did you know that the crab apple is the only apple that is native to North America? Want to take a guess how many varieties there are of apples in the U.S.? 200? 500? Try 2,500. Thinking healthy? Well, did you know that apples are fat-free, sodium-free, and cholesterol-free, and a medium apple is only about 80 calories? Did you know that apples are a member of the rose family, or that the apple tree originated between the Caspian and Black Sea? In colonial times, apples were called winter bananas, or melt-in-your-mouth. Want to take a guess? What's the most widely grown apple variety in the United States? Gala? Golden Delicious? Try Red Delicious. Okay, one last piece of trivia. America's longest living apple tree was reportedly planted in 1647 and was still bearing fruit in 1866. That's over 200 years later. But the tree didn't die due to old age or bad weather. Nope. The tree was actually struck by a derailed train. Let's get back to the show. Apple growers in the mid-Atlantic and northeastern regions have a mystery on their hands. There's been a wave of sudden deaths in young dwarf apple trees, which produce multiple varieties of apples. These popular trees, which appear perfectly healthy the season before and are often budding with apples, they suddenly deteriorate and die in a single season. Farmers are forced to dig up the infected trees and replant, hoping that the newly planted trees will not end up suffering the same fate. Here in Pennsylvania, it's very common. For each acre, the cost is about 3500 for them. So it's really a serious issue because in Pennsylvania, and a lot of apple farmers are smaller. So they have something like, you know, 20 acres. And uh, if they're... Block are affected, they have to replant it, so it's a big issue. 
That's plant pathologist Dr. Ruhu Lee. We're talking inside her greenhouse at the National Germplasm Resources Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland. That noise you hear is the air circulation within the greenhouse. Dr. Lee has been working on this mystery since 2015, when she first visited a small orchard in Pennsylvania that had trees dying from rapid apple decline. Through an advanced technique called high-throughput sequencing, she was able to identify several viruses in the infected trees, including two new viruses. We basically found uh, the virus is there, but it's not in all affected trees. So it's tightly associated, but it's not completely associated. There is something going on. There are a lot of theories, and some people think it's the change of the cultivation. Some people think it's herbicide damage. Some people think it's winter damage, because when there is a severe winter, and then you know, the next year, more trees will die. So it's a complicated issue. Let's back up for a second. Farmers have been planting dwarf apple trees for decades because they're small, but they're also tall, which makes them easier to pick and organize in an orchard. Think nice clean rows for pickers and tractors to move through. They also grow and mature faster, which means greater yields and less time than traditional trees. But unlike traditional trees, dwarf apple trees are dying in significant numbers due to rapid apple decline, which occurs in the bark of a tree and isn't noticeable until years after it's been infected. Scientists believe the disease attacks the vascular tissue in the bark, essentially choking off the pathways that carry vital water and nutrients throughout the tree. Rapid apple decline is killing dwarf trees in some of the nation's top apple-producing states, including Pennsylvania, New York, where they call it sudden apple decline, and as far as Washington state. Right now, we, don't, we cannot even call it a disease, because there are a lot of theories. What I have done is collect some shoots from the infected trees and brought it back, and in 2017, we grafted it in the greenhouse and we're trying to see if we can demonstrate its passaging cause of the problem, and we don't really know yet. So these are the ones that, that you've gotten from the nursery and we're, we've replanted, and you probably have to wait another year or two to see if the disease comes yes. to fruition? Yes, this one, this tree. We grow them in the screen house, and uh, we want to see if this infected plants can choose similar symptoms. Through her research, if she can pinpoint the problem, breeders can use her research and findings to breed new rootstocks that are resistant to symptoms associated with rapid apple decline. It's a serious issue in, the, in Pennsylvania and also in west part of the New York. So if we can prove the dwarf rootstock is a problem, and Hopefully, the scientists can find another good stock to replace it and have problem solved. We're standing out here in the middle of an apple orchard. What we have are several rows on either side of us of, of apples, um, most of which still have a lot of green on them. Some of them are starting to get some red color. And, and what varieties are these? Um, I think this is, um, uh, this might be snap stamen. We've got uh, some red delicious, some uh, uh, mutsu, I think. Just a A nice variety. The apple industry is a highly impactful business for the U.S., both in providing consumers with healthy fruit and ensuring a stable market for our economy. Growers are always looking for new varieties that are not only tasty, but more resistant to disease outbreaks and environmental stressors that can severely reduce apple production. Developing these new varieties takes time, like over two decades or longer, before they're ready for your shopping cart. Plant physiologist Dr. Tim Artlip is researching ways to drastically speed up the process. He works at the Appalachian Fruit Research Station in Kearneysville, West Virginia. One of the bigger challenges is how long does it take to come up with a named variety like Honeycrisp? 
A lot of people love Honeycrisp. They love that sweet, tart flavor, that crunch. Growers love it because it does uh, garner a, a, a greater return on investment, but they also have to be very, very careful about their inputs to the tree and making sure that that delicious, sweet, tart flavor and that crunch comes through. So it's a challenge. Honeycrisp was created from a crossbreed made back in the 70s at the University of Minnesota. Breeders quickly realized they had a promising apple in their hands. Still, it had to go through years of trials, tests for disease resistance, and sensory evaluations by consumers. It wasn't given the plant name Honeycrisp until the late 80s, and it wasn't released for production until 1991. So you think about that, that's 15 years right there, and then most trees have a juvenile period where they don't bear. They just, they just grow until they're finally competent to flower. That's a big challenge when you think about it. That, that might be 15, 20, 25 years from a particular cross to when the consumers actually get it in the grocery store. And a lot can happen in that period of time. Dr. Artlip and his team are using rapid cycle breeding techniques to speed up the process to cultivate new apple varieties. This process was the product of two advancements in science. The first occurred about a decade ago, when researchers successfully released the first genome sequence of an apple tree. Scientists like Dr. Artlip now had, in essence, a map of an apple tree's DNA. So we can actually go into an orchard where the breeders have made crosses between potential or between parents to make uh, potentially really good cultivars. And normally that process may take 15, 20, 25 years. And initially that just takes acres and acres of trees to find something that might be worth pursuing. Instead, we can go through, take just a few leaves from a, from a young seedling go through and do the sequencing and also the, mar the knowledge of the various markers and know very quickly, does this seedling have the potential to have a nice sweet acid balance? Will it give us mealy uh, or firm uh, flesh in the fruit? What color skin is it going to have? What kind of disease resistance does it have? We can know that very quickly, but we're still limited trees are going to take a year or so just to grow from seed and it may take a few years to uh, to actually grow them out to see what we get. That leads us to the second advancement. Dr. Artlet's team worked with the researchers from Germany to develop an early flowering apple tree. It's absolutely amazing. We go from a, a normal juvenile period where the trees are not competent to flower or bear fruit that usually is three, four years or longer down to one year. And not just that, these trees will continuously flower. It is really striking to see a tree that has fruit and flower together. The rapid breeding cycle enables researchers to determine if a new seedling variety has traits that are appealing to consumers. Think taste, crunch, look, sweet tart balance. It also allows researchers to try and solve issues that can damage millions of apple trees, like cultivating a longer, deeper rooting system that would allow for greater access to water during droughts, or breeding resistance to a particular pest that's running amok in orchards. This rapid cycle breeding program has the potential to really be a game changer. Rather than having to wait years and years, we can adapt more readily to changing conditions. After all, what the USDA ARS wants to do is to try to make sure that we have a safe and stable food supply, including nutritious apples. That wraps up this edition of Science in Your Shopping Cart. Stay tuned for future podcasts. And in case you missed it, check out our podcast on our red spinach, Roma tomato, and huckleberry gold potato. It's a podcast that's packed with vitamins and flavor. For Science in Your Shopping Cart, I'm Todd Silver. Thanks for listening. Science in Your Shopping Cart is produced by the Office of Communications, Agricultural Research Service, an agency of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. For more information, visit www.ars.usda.gov. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram 
Like us on Facebook and watch us on YouTube.